Father, we're just going to open up your word and we thank you that Jesus, Yeshua, he is the living word. He is the word. And so we open the word, inviting Holy Spirit, the spirit of truth to minister. That Yeshua, you would be so exalted. That everything would be around you. And Father, we thank you that we are in a nation where we have the freedom to come together. We have the freedom to worship. We have the freedom to open your word any time we want to. And we thank you for that. So turn to Ephesians chapter 1. We're just, um, I know we've already taken up a fair bit of time, but, you know, nothing's as important as the word and the Holy Spirit. We're looking at Ephesians. We're going to be going through the book of Ephesians. We looked at it a week before last, and then last week we had our celebration days. But Ephesians is a drink of pure grace and truth, and you've just got to drink deep. It's just the most amazing book. Uh, and we looked at it as an overview quite, quite simply. The wealth, chapters 1 to 3. The walk, chapters 4 and 5, and first part of chapter 6, and the war. The wealth, the walk, and the war. The wealth is who we are and what we have in Christ. The walk is how to walk it out. And it starts that in Ephesians chapter 4, verse 1. And then it is the war. But notice that you can't go to war until you know your wealth. You don't go to war unless you know what you've got. You don't go to war unless you've taken stock. You don't go to war unless you know who's with you, who's not with you. You don't go to war unless you know what's happening. And so the war is at the end of the book. And it's like the Holy Spirit saying, there will be warfare. But I want you to know your wealth, who you are in Christ, what you have in Christ. I want you to know how to walk it out in the natural so that you're protected in the way that you live and then you can go to war because you know who you are in Christ. Everything in the kingdom comes back to, apart from the king, comes back to identity. And that's one of the things that we sometimes don't quite have a grasp on is who we are in Christ. So it's about the wealth, the walk and the war. So today, okay, so I love Ephesians. Colossians is my favorite book. But Ephesians is amazing. It's almost like Paul is, is just so drunk in the Holy Ghost that he just can't wait to get out to you how amazing you are, how important you are, how much God loves you. It's like Paul's got this, this well just bubbling up on the inside. And even though he's in prison, he's the freest man that ever lived apart from Jesus. And so he's pouring out what, he thinks that, what God thinks about you. And, and so the first chapter, verses 1 to 14, is this amazing worship and praise and then chapters 15 to the end it's a prayer it's like he can't help himself everything is up to the father about Jesus it's just pouring out but he's wanting you to know who you are how the father sees you how much the father loves you it is the best book it's one of the best because I say that about every book <laughs> although I do struggle with chronicles name after name after name that only a mother could love right oh god Praise God for Jabez, that little break in the middle, you know, but, but th this is just amazing. And what it is, when you look at this, this is God's love letter to you. The Father has written a love letter to you and it is, it is addressed to you. It's, it's authored by the Holy Ghost. Now, Paul might have penned it, but the Holy Spirit's the author. And, and he's just releasing it into your lives. And he's just got such a heart of passion. like It's, it's almost like he, he, his words trip over themselves. He even kind of repeats himself a couple of times. And we sometimes think of Paul as being this staid kind of killjoy kind of a person at times. But he's awesome. Yeah. Yeah. And he is a little bit tipsy, I think, when he wrote this. <laughs> just a little bit on the wild side. Just a little bit under the influence. Because, man, it's not, it's not like Romans. It's not like Romans. It's not like Hebrews. This is a completely different kind of letter. And so it's, it's just, and there's, uh, I think, about 15 references to uh, Christ and 25. I hope I'm right. I haven't got a clue. I wrote it down somewhere. Who knows? But there's about um, 15 references to who we are in him, in Christ, in the Messiah, and about 25 to God as Father. So he's really trying to get a point across here. The other thing I want you to, I, I really, like, honestly, in these, end, in these times that we're moving into, I'm not saying in times, I'm just saying the times we're moving into, there is, and it could well be end times, I'm just saying in these times, because times are changing so quickly. In these times, unless you know who you are in Christ, 
you can be knocked sideways. You can lose your footing a little bit. So we need to know who we are in Christ. And there is 143 scriptures in the New Testament that reveal who you are. 143. In Christ, by Christ, with Christ, by whom, by the blood, in the blood. But the 143 scriptures that all talk about who you are as a new creation. Because we've got to realise when we, died, when we gave our lives to Jesus Christ, we died at that place. Yeah. Who I am, who I was in the old Adam was crucified with Christ. And I was raised up a new creation in the second Adam. So the first Adam lifestyle that I had, the first Adam, Suzette's dead and buried. She, she tries to resurrect every now and again, but she should be dead and buried, okay? But we, we are the, we're in the second Adam. We're a brand new creation, never before seen. Like, how amazing is this? Thing is, it's our mind that tries to say, oh, but you were, oh, but you have. This is your problem. Will you come from this? And you think, no, that, that was crucified. That should be in the grave, right? So the more you know who you are, the more, the more, oh, man, the more immovable you are, the more steadfast you are, the more miracle signs and wonders that follow you, the more things happen, the more the power, the passion, the anointing of the Holy Ghost flows over you. Man, it's just, an, and I get so frustrated. I was with a group of ministers uh, uh, the other, uh, about over a week ago. Oh, my. I am not perfect, letting you know right now, not perfect, you know me, not perfect, right? Under construction. But they're sitting there saying, oh, well, you know, at, at our age. And, you know, and I'm thinking, flip. I'm older than some of you. I'm older. Right? But we're supposed to have 120. These people are, are kind of hanging up the boots a little bit, 65, 70. I'm 71. I've still got about 30 good years to make an impact for the kingdom. And then I've got at least another 12 to supervise people and then I can just sit back and relax until I hit 120. I'm not going out before then. But to hear people talk about, well, you know, at this age, then what age? You're in Christ. The Lord renews your youth. What is this age business? And they're ministers. And then one of them is a little bit prophetic, said, I have a feeling, probably showed on my face, I wouldn't say it was very prophetic, probably showed, uh, you have something to say. <laughs> yes, I did. So, you know, I was tolerated, I was patronised, and then it was like, yeah, I think you're right. <laughs> yeah! <laughs> because we can't accept the stuff that comes from the world. And you can't accept the stuff that comes from the first Adam because it's got nothing to do with us. I might have to live here, but I'm, not, I'm, not, I'm in it, but I'm not of it. So, you know, we've got to, we've got to um, and I know you don't like the word change, but we are changing from glory to glory to glory, right? We are making a change. We're, we are really going to live as new creation realities. And so this first part of Ephesians, man, Paul is really trying to get something across to us. I'm glad it's not like the Corinthians letter because that's kind of like rebuke, rebuke, rebuke. And he's, he's even trying to prove to them, that like, I'm an apostle. No, really, really, I'm an apostle. If you read the book of Corinthians, he's even trying to convince them of his calling God. But in Ephesians here, it's like a, a different kind of letter altogether. And it's just, it's just the pure love of the Father that's just pouring out. And so we're going to read it through and then I'm just going to take it verse by verse and it's not going to be very long because we covered a part of it last time. And we looked last time at Acts chapter 18 and 19 where there were seven significant happenings that contributed to the, book of the, to the church of Ephesus. And then we looked at Revelation chapter 2 verses 1 to 4 where the church of Ephesus was rebuked. They'd lost their first love. So we don't want to lose our first love. And uh, some of the main Christ in this book of Ephesians, you'll see Christ as the fullness of God. You'll see Christ as the head of the church. He's the bridegroom. He's the giver of ministries. He's the grace of God. And he is our peace. Everything revolves around him. So the first 14 verses, which I will read now, are worship. And then he goes straight into a prayer, like he's just communing with God as he pours this out. Paul, an apostle of Jesus Christ by the will of God, to the saints who are in Ephesus and faithful in Christ Jesus, grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. 
Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places in Christ, just as he chose us in him before the foundation of the world, that we should be holy and without blame before him in love, having predestined us to adoption as sons by Jesus Christ to himself, according to the good pleasure of his will, to the praise of the glory of his grace, by which he made us accepted in the beloved. In him we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of sins according to the riches of his grace, which he made to abound toward us in all wisdom and prudence, having made known to us the mystery of his will, according to his good pleasure, which he purposed in himself, that in the dispensation of the fullness of the times he might gather together in one all things in Christ, both which are in heaven and which are on earth, in him. In him also we've obtained an inheritance, being predestined according to the purpose of him who works all things according to the counsel of his will, that we, who first trusted in Christ, should be to the praise of his glory. In him you also trusted, after you heard the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation, in whom also, having believed, you were sealed with the Holy Spirit of promise, who is the guarantee of our inheritance, until the redemption of the purchased possession to the praise of his glory. That's just so much, like you just want to take it, you know, phrase by phrase. It's just awesome. But let me challenge you. Read it in the New Living. Read it in the Passion. Read it in the, in the Message. Read it in a different translation. Because sometimes when we read the Word, there is a spirit of familiarity. And in our head, we go, yeah, I know that. Yeah, I know that. No, we don't know that unless it's a living revelation in our heart. So, you know, and, and look at, and Kurt, you'll appreciate what I'm saying here. Look at Young's literal translation. I checked it out today, Kurt. It's not that far different from it. But, you know, but, but look it out in different translations. Check it out. What's it saying to you? Take it phrase by phrase. What is the phrase that is speaking to you? What is the phrase that's ministering to you? What is it that God is actually wanting to say to you in this? Because in order to be effective, we have to be reflective. Let me repeat that. In order to be effective... We have to be reflective. We have to take the time to meditate, to sit in his presence, like Peter was saying earlier, to sit in his presence. God, what are you saying? How do you want to minister to me? What is it you want to show me? How can I work this into my life? What do you want to do? We need to be reflective. Right? Right? Take the time. I know it's busy, but take the time to just sit in his presence and listen. Leave your prayer requests outside the door and just take a scripture, something that's on your heart, and sit in his presence. So let us just take this word by word. And already, apart from the fact that in verse 1, you know, he's saying... Um, um, that he is an apostle and it's by Jesus Christ, that already in verse 1 that there is a division. So we'll talk about that. But right before I start, let me just emphasize this. The importance of knowing who you are in Christ is that as is the king, so goes the kingdom. As is the king, so goes the people. So if the king goes to war and is defeated, the people are a defeated people. If the king goes to war and is victorious, the people are victorious. As is the king, so goes the kingdom. And one person represents a nation. We saw that with David in 1 Samuel chapter 17 when he went to war against Goliath. He represented the nation. Right? In those days they settled wars with one, one man from here and one man from this nation and they'd slug it out. But David had already been anointed king. He hadn't taken the position, but he had been anointed as king. And he took on Goliath and he won. And because he won, Israel won over the Philistines. So as is the king, so are his, so are his citizens. How awesome is that? Right? So understand about this. Get this into you. It's so important. Jesus won the victory over Satan. And because he did, so did we. 
And, and verses 4 to 14 are in three different sections, really. Um, the first one is a celebration. The second one is God's choice and God's plan. And the last one is an inheritance. But we'll look at that as we go through. And I don't want to get intellectual. I don't want to get knowledgeable. Like, I don't want to move in the intellect. I want the power of the Holy Spirit in this. You know, because... But if you also look at it, this is amazing. Look, there's so much. If you look at it, this is like a, 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 an expression of the present day Passover. Because they were coming out of the slavery of sin. They had to go through the blood and they were entering the promised land. It is sort of like, look back to Passover, and now you can see it being worked out through Christ and the Ephesians church. It's just amazing if you, if you look at the similarities. So allow the Holy Spirit to weave whatever he wants to weave in you and through you with the word. So the first one, the demarcation is Paul, an apostle of Jesus Christ, by the will of God to the saints who are in Ephesus and the faithful in Christ Jesus. So you can have saints or you can be faithful. So anybody who's born again is a saint. But then there are those who are the faithful. You know, they're the ones who don't just go to church on a Sunday. They don't just, that they actually live it. So there are the saints. Everybody who's born again is a saint. But then there's the faithful. And we, we, we see it in churches, don't we? we? We see the ones that are the faithful. Not necessarily, they might not have a position of leadership, but they live a different kind of lifestyle to anybody else. And so there's, there's this demarcation here. So the saints is basically God's work because when we got born again, he made us saints. But the faithfulness is our response. That's my response to what God has done in me. And then he says... Grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. Grace to you and peace. Grace to you and shalom. Grace to you and total well-being from the God the Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. And then in verse 3, Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ who has blessed us with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places in Christ Jesus. Blessed be the God and Father who has blessed us, past tense. Every spiritual blessing is now in your possession. Every spiritual blessing. You lack nothing. It has all been given to you. It, you were blessed, have been blessed with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places in Christ, just as he chose you in love before the world's foundation, that you should be holy and without blame before him in love. So you were chosen before the foundation of the world, but who chose you? Love. Because God is love. And you can, you can substitute the word love for God all the way through the Bible. Because God is love. Love created, you know, the heavens and the earth. But you were chosen. And you are holy and blameless in his sight because he sees you through Jesus Christ. When he looks at you, he's got this filter on. And he says, there's, there's Muriel. Sorry, Muriel, but you were right there. There's Muriel. <laughs> Oh, look at her. She's awesome. She's so pure. She's blameless. She's innocent. She's justified. She's vindicated because he looks at us through the filter of Jesus. He looks at us through that filter of the blood of the lamb. So we're holy and we're blameless in his sight. And, and this plan of salvation was put into, into, what do you call it, was created, was thought about before the foundation of the world. God knew that what would going to happen with Adam and Eve. And so before the foundation of the world, the lamb of God was slain. Salvation's plan was put into, into effect before the, the foundation of the world. How amazing is our God? He knew what it would cost him. Jesus knew what it would cost him. And yet, from eternity past, it was put into play. That is love. That is love in action, holy and blameless because of his love expressed through his son, Jesus. You know what that basically means? That you are marked with the love of God the Father. Amen. You are marked with it. Marked in your heart. Marked. You're just marked. You know, when they look at you, people, you're just marked with the love of God. And because you're marked with the love of God, the favor of God goes before you. The peace of God lives within you. You're marked 
with the love of God. And it just is the most amazing thing to walk through life marked by the love of the Father. How awesome is that? And in verse 5, it says, Having predestined us to adoption as sons by Jesus Christ to himself, according to the good pleasure of his will, to the praise of the glory of his grace. I think it's three or four times in these sentences it talks about the praise of his glory. This one adds grace. But according to God's good pleasure, like God delights in this. He delights in this. It was lovingly planned. You were predestined. You were predestined to be adopted as God's own son. This was God's kind intention. This was his good pleasure. This was his desire. And that word predestined is found four times in the New Testament, two times in the book of Ephesians, and twice in Romans 8, verses 29 and 30. Let me tell you, and Paul is talking here, he was a Roman citizen, and an adoption in Rome was very different. So when someone was adopted, say there was a slave in a Roman family that was doing a great job, and the, the father of the family, the patriarch, looked at this slave and thought, you know what, I really love him. He's worked well. He's served well. I want to adopt him. And so that, that Roman master would sever every tie to servanthood, if of want of a better word. He'd sever every tie. And he would then go and, and say in the marketplace and say to his family, I am now his father. And I am the full owner of him and I have all legal rights. And now he has all legal rights of Roman citizenship. So anything he had as a slave, forgotten about, he's now adopted into the family and he has the same rights and privileges as the other children. But on the other hand, he could never be disinherited. He could never be disowned. Once you were adopted, you could never be disowned. You're never going to be kicked out of the family. You belong to him. God has taken full authority and full responsibility for your life. And on the other side of things, you have the full rights and privileges of being a kingdom citizen, a child of God, a member of the royal household, an ambassador for Christ, whatever area he wants you to work in. So sin and the ties that tied us to sin and Satan have been severed completely. There is nothing that holds us back except anything that we might have not renewed in our mind. But he is our heavenly father and because he's our heavenly father, we are heirs of God, which means everything God has, we are entitled to. Did you notice that he gave you the keys of the kingdom, not the keys to the kingdom? If you had the keys to the kingdom, you actually had to get in, but you've got the keys of the kingdom, which means that you can access anything in the kingdom that you want. He withholds nothing from his people. You know what? And, and for those of us who've got a an orphan mentality or, or kind of think sometimes like a beggar, there's just no place for that in the kingdom. When Tonga, went back in the time of Captain Cook and Tonga was, um, well, you know, their, their god over Tonga is the shark god because it's always surrounded by sharks. And Captain Cook arrived and the boat came out to meet them with the chief on it and the, the, the challenge was made if two of your sailors can swim to shore without being eaten by sharks we'll accept your god as god well two so two sailors i don't know whether they were pushed or volunteered <laughs> but they swam and the sharks didn't touch them and so tonga the the chief and everything gave everything over to to god through jesus christ now the beautiful thing is that he was a uh, disciple by a man of god who was on captain cook's boat and I think it uh, uh, was a short period of time and the chief was baptised in the Holy Ghost Ooh. and fire. And he wrote the constitution for the island of Tonga as a king through the revelation that he got of what it meant to be a king in a kingdom. And so in, in the past, the chief owned all of the land in, in um, Tonga. But when he became king, he gave every family a portion of land because that is common wealth. That is common wealth. And so the whole thing changed, you know, and I don't know how many times Tonga has said that the nation belongs to Jesus Christ. 
So we've got to get an understanding of what it means to live as kings yeah. and what it means that, you know, this, this orphan stuff that every now and again crops up, this, this beggarly kind of praying, oh, God, please, God, can you do this? God, can I need? There's none of that in the kingdom. I have access to everything he's got. I just kind of say, thank you. Yeah. Thank you, God, I received my healing. Thank you, God, I received this need met. Thank you. Because he's already provided provision through Jesus Christ. Everything that we need is provided through Jesus. And let me tell you something. When Jesus was on that cross and he destroyed poverty, he didn't just destroy it individually. He destroyed mammon. He destroyed Babylonian culture. He destroyed the banking system. And we don't pick that up. We don't recognize that. We don't get it at all in Jesus name we don't understand what's going on I have no idea what's going on we don't no idea what's going on but it's but you know when he destroyed it he destroyed everything that made up the Babylonian world culture mammon he destroyed it all and yet we still think we're fighting this big massive thing no it's a defeated thing it's a defeated thing And if you're in business, to think that you're coming against this giant Babylonian system, come from the fact fact that Jesus Christ destroyed it and it's under your feet. Come to the fact that he destroyed it at the cross. He destroyed hell's health economy, health system at the cross. So he gave us healing and and wholeness. He gave us prosperity. He gave us wisdom. Everything that came out of the kingdom of darkness was destroyed. But to hear us talk, you would think that the Babylonian world culture, the system of greed is still prevalent. It's still got this massive hold. It doesn't. It was defeated. It has a hold because of deception. The truth is it was destroyed. And when we start to walk in that truth, things will start to change. Don't get me started. Don't get me started. (laughs) We've really got to get a hold on this because half the time what we pray for is something that Jesus has already given us. The way we live is sometimes because it's something that we don't realize Jesus has already destroyed. And he's given us the opposite. We should be living so differently. You know, and I look back to where I came from, single mum, six kids on a pension. And now I travel the world preaching the gospel, training in prayer, um, doing all sorts of things. And looking back, who would have thunk it? Definitely not me. You know, I wouldn't have thunk that. All I thought about was putting the next meal on the table and keeping food on the, on the table, clothes on the kids' back, a roof over our heads. And now look at this. It's just been amazing. But it's when you recognize nothing can stand against me. Right? You've got to get that righteous anger. I am in Christ. If you're in the king, nothing can come against you. You are as unshakable as the king is unshakable. Amen? You, can, you live in an unshakable kingdom. You, you, that's who you are. You cannot be shaken. You're in Christ. You, you are so... Look, honestly, what is it that we come to church and we lose sense of, of what God is trying to tell us? Instead of the revelation, we go by intellect. And, and we look at the tree of the knowledge of good and evil instead of the tree of life. Everything Jesus Christ has, you are. Everything he possesses, you possess. You lack nothing. You walk into a room and you walk in as Christ. You change the atmosphere by walking in. You know, and we've got to get this righteous anger when the enemy comes against us. How dare you? How dare you come against God's anointed? How dare you touch what God has paid for? God owns me, right? God owns us. He paid for us with the blood of Jesus. We are not our own. I now have a new owner. It's no longer Satan because when I was in the kingdom of darkness, he owned me. But God paid the price through Jesus Christ and God owns me. God paid the price. God bought me. I belong to him. So how dare you touch God's property? the other aspect of it you cannot accept one thing from the kingdom of darkness not one thing the other aspect of it you want to take me on I've seen a few Rambo movies I've seen Stallone I've seen it 
But I have actually stood in my room and said, you want to take me on? Come and have a go. Because behind me, I have Jesus Christ. I am covered in the blood and the government of heaven backs me. So you really want to take me on? You really want to touch God's anointed? You really want to know what it's like? differently right live differently how dare the enemy touch you you are God's temple he paid for you he bought you he owns you how dare he touch you come on and this is what Paul's saying in Ephesians. My gosh, you're blessed, you're chosen, you're being adopted. All of these amazing things. He's saying, this is who you are. It's not who you think you are. This is the reality of who you are. Oh, my gosh. And when you know the, the, the full picture of what Jesus Christ did at the cross, nothing was left out. Whatever comes against you, whether it's sickness, disease, financial worries, whether it's toxic relationships, you know, problems in the family, doesn't matter what comes against you, it was destroyed at the cross. Doesn't matter what's happened to you, even abuse, Jesus was abused at the cross. Even sexual abuse because he was stripped naked in front of everybody. He went through everything. Every, everything, Satan's kingdom was totally destroyed. Yes, yes, yes. Totally. So we should be living in a realm of victory. Yes. <laughs> that surpasses description. The thing is, we need to listen to the Father like Jesus did. He only did what the Father told him to do. He only did that. And he said what the Father told him to say. So there's a, a depth of intimacy with the Heavenly Father that we have to walk into with Abba. I often say, Father, would you father me through this? Because I don't know how to do this. But you're my father. You're my daddy. Daddy knows best. Father me through this. And it's just so awesome because it's just amazing what happens and how things change and, and what happens in our life. Thing is, things are just amazing. But everything, oh, my gosh. When you understand what Jesus has given you, you live with a ferocity and a fierceness for the abundant life that Jesus has come to give you. You don't want anything less. You don't want anything less. And I know that a couple of months ago when I was really ill, it would have been so easy to go home. I, I was that ill. I could have just closed my eyes and just said, God, take me. But I'm not going out because the devil took me. I'm going the Celtic way. God's going to say, this is the date. Are you happy with this date to come home? And I'm going to say, let's talk about it. And then we're going to have a party, a praise and worship party. We're going to bless everybody, worship, prophesy over people. Then I'm going to lie down and die and let you guys explain it to the coppers. <laughs> but I'm going Celtic. That's the way they went. The father would actually invite them home. Hey, I'm thinking this would be a good date to come home. What do you think? And you've heard this story before, and I can never remember the dude's name. But he said, oh, yes, Lord, I can't wait to get home. Yes, so looking forward to it. Yes, let's, that's a deal. It's done. And then about three weeks later, the Lord comes back and says, uh, my, my translation, good news, bad news. Good news, you're still coming home. Bad news is the church has prayed. And they said, you're the best teacher that we've got. We want to, they want him to stay. So he said, I've given you another three years. Yeah, another three years. Well, he was not happy. Oh, my gosh. It took him a little while to become surrendered to the will of God. He was cranky with the church. He didn't want to teach him. He didn't want to have anything to do with him. It took him a while to work through some stuff. But then, you know, there was a work of love. And then the next three years later, God comes back and says, you're ready to come home? I think this date, what do you think? And he said, God, can we make it three days later? 
because that's right in the middle of Harvest Festival and I want to be here for that with my friends. See, this, this, this is the way it should be. Am I wrong? Well, I don't care if I'm wrong. I'm going that way. <laughs> right? Unless I'm, I'm out in the, in the rapture first, whatever happens. But, but sickness and disease shouldn't take us out. Old age shouldn't take us out. We go out when we're ready to go home. When the father says, you know, yeah, you've finished your assignment. Come on. Stop and think about how you're living. There's some changes coming. And so in verse 6, it says that uh, to the praise of the glory of his grace by which he made us accepted in the beloved. The glory of God's grace made us accepted in the beloved. And it was lavished freely upon us. So if I am in the beloved and you are in the beloved, what are you? Beloved. You are God's beloved. How amazing is that? You are God's beloved. You're totally accepted. No effort on our part. It's just because we're in him. And then it says in verse 7, we've been redeemed through the blood, the forgiveness of sins according to the riches of his grace. And I, I love Psalm 107 verse 2. I am the redeemed of the Lord and I say so, for he has redeemed me from the hand of the enemy. Amen. So, you know, so we've been redeemed, totally bought. God has paid the ransom for us and set us completely free from the hand of the enemy. And it was all because of the riches of the grace. And redeemed is about 10 times in the New Testament. And it actually means a release and an effect of freedom procured by a payment of ransom. God paid the ransom in full. And then in verse 8 it says, and we're just running through this course of time, but in verse 8 it says, which he made to abound toward us in all wisdom and prudence. We have all wisdom and prudence. Prudence is like understanding, insight, knowledge. You have it all. You lack nothing. You have all of God's wisdom and understanding. And Jesus is the wisdom of God and you're in him. So all of the wisdom of God is in you. Like how can we lose? Remember the story of Dr. Carver? The, uh, the peanut maker guy, he was a, he was a slave on, an, on a plantation back in the 1800s. He was a young boy. He was a slave. Um, but the master kind of liked him. He saw he had a bit of intelligence. But Carver, I can't remember his first name, Dr. Carver, Washington. George Washington Carver. Thank you, Leah. He went for a walk with the Lord in the mornings. And when he went on this walk, he said, Lord, would you teach me the wonders of the universe? And God said to him, no, it's a little bit outside your pay grade. <laughs> However, I will teach you the secrets of the peanut. Out of that, he had over 300 patents on a peanut. And in the south, they had had so many, um, they'd had so many harvests of cotton that the soil had been depleted. And when the farmers would come to him, because they knew that he had some kind of an intelligence, and they said to him, look, the soil's really depleted. What are we going to do if we put another more cotton in it's going to be very poor and he said plant peanuts which which re-energized the soil and then they came to him and said what do we do when we harvest the peanuts which is where he went for another walk with God and came back with 300 patents you know all peanut butter and all sorts of things just amazing when you read his life story but he went for this walk with God so all the wisdom of God is in you Amen. all the knowledge all the understanding of God is in you like, I mean, you lack nothing. You are as wise as Jesus because he is the wisdom of God. It's getting on, so I might finish this here. I was hoping to get to verse 14, but we're not going to do it. We're not going to do it. But let me just say this, guys. I want to anoint all of you because some of you are not in the place that you should be in life. Some of you are not in the right position. And there is always more with God. Even if you're in the right position and you're in the right place, there's always more. Yeah, so I want to anoint all of you with oil that you would be positioned right where God wants you to be, that there would be a release of an anointing upon your life, that you would start to live as Jesus Christ, that you would walk in the fire, the freedom, the power, the passion of the Holy Ghost, that you would recognize the mood swings of the Holy Spirit. When I say mood swings, I mean mood swings. Because he, he can, you know, we can grieve him, we can make him angry, but we're supposed to be drunk in the Holy Ghost. We're supposed to be living an inebriated lifestyle, right? 
to look at us, we're pickled, <laughs> but not exactly inebriated, not exactly flowing in the, you know. So there, there needs to become a bit of a looseness, a bit of that, that starchiness, that stiffness has got to go because, man, Jesus didn't come take us to heaven. We say get saved and go to heaven. Jesus never once offered heaven to anybody. What Jesus offered was abundant life. He said, the thief comes to steal, kill and destroy, but I've come to give you an abundant life. And that means an abundant life financially, an abundant life in health, an abundant life in wisdom, an abundant life in impact and effect and, and significance and affluence and, and all of that. Every area, abundant life. Because when we live that abundant life, the people in the world are going to say, man, like that, oh, what was it, Harry met Sally or whatever that thing was, I want what, she, I want what she's got. The world's going to look at us living up this abundant life and they're going to say, I want what they've got. And that will cause an influx into the kingdom. Because let me tell you, telling them that they'll go to hell if they don't give their lives to Jesus, Jesus just brings fear. And we are dealing with a post-Christian world. They don't really give a rip about God or the Bible. They haven't been brought up in church. They haven't gone to children's church. They haven't, you know, we used to say the Lord's Prayer in school. They don't do that. So we're dealing with a post-Christian, pre-Christian world. So what worked in the past is not going to work now, but a lifestyle of abundance. That will make an impact on people. Amen. I've had people walk into my house, you know, and say, man, there's just something here. I've had one guy who couldn't even enter my lounge room. He just could not walk in. And I'm thinking, what's wrong with you, dude? You're a Christian, I thought. <laughs> but there's, there's, there's got to be this redemptive lifestyle. And we talk about Goshen. We want to have our own Goshen. But I really don't want to name it Goshen. That's why we've got sanctuary. Because Goshen was about dispossessing people. And dispossessing people from inheritances, even though it was a refuge for God's people. Joseph wasn't exactly the kindest of people. He never gave the Egyptians a chance to buy their land back. That's right. Sorry? Joseph never gave the Egyptians a chance to buy their land back. It was like, well, run out of money, then I'll take your cattle. Run out of cattle, then I'll take your land. Take your children. Take your children. And then there was, there was no real redemption or salvation back. So we've got to live differently. It's that abundant lifestyle. But I want you to see at that cross, Jesus Christ destroyed everything that would ever come against you. I don't care what it is. I don't care whether it's stage four cancer. I don't care whether it's an ingrown toenail. I don't care whether it's a debt that you can't pay or a house you can't afford to buy. I don't care. Jesus destroyed it at the cross. And when we walk in that victory and we understand that everything that belongs to the kingdom of heaven is now ours, you live differently. You don't go saying, God, give me wisdom. It's, oh, my gosh, Jesus, thank you. You are the wisdom of God. You live inside me. Just what wisdom do I need for this? Right? You, we ask him for things we already have. When my kids did that to me when they were little, I got cranky. I mean, you can just open the fridge and help yourself. They did anyway, but you know what I mean? If they ask for stuff, and, and, if, if, and we heard this, was it Friday night, Danielle? I think we heard it in the training we're doing. Your child doesn't come to you and say, Mum, I gave away a tenth of my sandwich at school today. Can I please, I've tithed my lunch. Can I please have dinner? It's not about that. It's not about tithing religiously it's about tithing as abraham did it out of pure gratitude and praise for what god has done it, tithe was not instituted by god it was instituted by abram who was so grateful that he said this is all i, I just want to give back god is so good god is so good